one of my problems in giving this oration, apart from the fact that narcissism made me think I, uh, I was capable of doing it, is that the only quality I share with Gandhi is not a spiritual one, it's the physical one of having a shaven head. Um, but I do welcome those like myself who are intrigued and moved to self-questioning and to the questioning of the exercises of power on the earth uh, by the Mahatma Mohandas Gandhi, who was killed by assassins on this day so long ago in 1948. I'm not qualified, as I said, to define this extraordinary uh, human, but I hope it doesn't seem an exercise in vanity if I use this lecture to raise, raise three issues which I find fascinating about the Mahatma and about Indian history. Uh, and I do hope that these issues are not entirely inappropriate to the day and that they reflect on some of the historic and moral aspects of his life. First, some more general words. When we in the non-Indian word world think of the Mahatma Mohandas Gandhi, we think at the same instance of peaceful disobedience. Earlier and more dazzling speakers like Justice Kirby, to whom I've been talking in the last couple of days and whose speech has been published, uh, have no doubt remarked that though the Mahatma's word Satyagraha is also often translated as passive resistance or to, considered to be synonymous with civil disobedience, these are translations that Gandhi himself considered inexact and mislead, misleading. Satyagraha means truth firmness or the employment of the force of truth. In a polemical country like Australia, we don't always understand that in accord with Gandhi's doctrine, when we stand up for what we believe to be the truth, all anger, all impulse to violence, verbal and otherwise, and all ego are supposed to have been eliminated from our resistance, from our demonstration, uh, and from our civil disobedience. At the one time, Satyagraha is seen in the West as both somehow cool and cuddly, but in fact, as Gandhi himself made clear, it's a fierce gospel to follow. So I make a very uh, partial disciple of Satyagraha. I find the essential uh, dispassion Gandhi requires as part of the equation to be unachievable in my case. Perhaps I can blame my combative Irish ancestry. Uh, Satyagrahi would not be angry in his resistance to injustice, would put up with a tax on his person and confiscation or damage to his property, and would not respond to any opposing force with insults and foul language. Uh, I fear I've probably failed in all those areas. <laughs> in the strike or heart eye that Gandhi organized in India in 1919, the intensity of repression, including the infamous General Dyer's slaughter of 300 Indians in Amritsar, evoked a responding violence from Indian strikers. And realizing it is hard for imperfect souls to answer violence in the spirit of his principle of Satyagraha, Gandhi called off the strike. He was willing to lose to win. Violence could not be defeated by violence. Then in a march in 1930, by, was connected with the SALT demonstrations, a march by a 2,500 strong corps of specially instructed Gandhi followers, including his wife, Kasturba. Uh, Gandhi had told the Viceroy very sportingly that they disbelieved in the British government's uh, monopoly over SALT and had been put in prison by the Viceroy, so he wasn't there. Uh, but 2,500 of his specially trained followers uh, were. Uh, and on the day, 
the march is advancing on the Darasana uh, salt works um, line by line, were met by police and struck down. Not, said a, wrote an American journalist, not one of the marchers even raised an arm to fend off blows. From where I stood, I heard the sickening wax of clubs on unprotected skulls. Those struck down lay sprawling, unconscious or writhing in pain with fractured skulls or broken shoulders. But the lines of marches came on until, said the journalist, I had an indefinable sense of helpless rage and loathing, almost as much against the men who were submitting unresistingly to being beaten as against the police wielding the clubs. When looked at in that way, Satyagra can see a, seem a one-sided field of slaughter, but because of the moral courage of those people at Darasana that day, the account I quote for uh, from appeared in nearly a hundred, uh, 100,500 uh, news outlets in the West was read into the record of the U US Senate, where it influenced that Democrat Aristo with his eye on the presidency, Franklin Delano Ro Roosevelt. It would provide a graphic in injury, uh, sorry, um, a graphic image of uh, moral over official force that it may well have brought about the Delhi Pact of the following year. In the pact, the Viceroy Irwin offered Gandhi concessions if he'd ceased, not from armed raids on government installations, not ambuscades and armed insurgencies, but the demonstrations of unarmed battalions of the force of truth. If there's a graduate student in the audience, I'd, I'd like to say in that connection uh, that one of the most successful movements in Ireland uh, for land justice was the Land League movement, out of which the boycott came, was totally non-violent. And I've always wondered how much Gandhi was influenced by that. So someone who's after an MA out there, get to work on that. <laughs> In our kind of society, ego and anger uh, uh, are two, uh, uh, well, let me say, I think polemic uh, on all sides, uh, too much influenced by ego uh, and anger. And uh, I confess to a considerable amount of ego when I edited uh, with Rosie Scott, a wonderful novelist, a collection by novelists and poets and memoirs, not a polemic book on refugees and asylum seekers, but a book that tried to look at them through the far more intimate and humanizing lenses of memoir, fiction, and verse. It's hard for me, as I help write such a, a book, to ignore the, my belief that our nation, if it goes on pursuing such punishing and name-calling policies, and if we fail in our duty under the convention, then we have somehow sacrificed part of our most cherished values. It's hard for me not to bring to the task then the conceited attitude, how dare my country let me down morally like this? I presume um, that uh, I am a citizen of a nation which has somehow lost some sort of moral ashes series, but who am I to expect it should win it? And maybe I should be content with the one we did win. Whereas the chief issue, of course, is not my moral outrage and not any anger. It's the Gandhian issue the question of indignity inflicted on these questing people, the asylum seekers, and not our spiritual discomfort. The question is this, are we in the outside somewhat sentimental, 
outside India, that is, selective and comfortable about Gandhi. He's certainly one of our universal saints, and Western reverence for him was further cemented in place by the Richard Attenborough film. But as I've implied, it proves easier for us to feel comfortable with some of his propositions than others. And so here is a quote from his newspaper, Harijan. Uh, I'm probably mispronouncing it, and I, I give the Hindus in the audience, uh, Australian or not, the permission to laugh at my pronunciation the way we laugh about, uh, at Americans when they call Kanandra Kanawindra. Uh, so Harry Jean, I think it's pronounced. The first sentence reads, nonviolent resistors will calmly die wherever they are, but they will not bend the knee before the aggress aggressor. The third sentence reads, non-violent resistors will have won the day in as much as they will have preferred extermination to submission. But an intervening sentence is even harder to face. The underlying belief in such non-violent resistance is that an aggressor will in time be mental, mentally or even physically tired of killing non-violent resistors. Now, if we take that sentence literally, uh, the proposition might fail in the short term, Gandhi's proposition, if a reader boringly pointed out that the killing agency might simply change shifts amongst its personnel or recruit new, and, or recruit new staff. Gandhi's phrase, in time be mentally and even physically tired of killing, can involve a very long time indeed, because Stalin's gulags were run on violent methods for decades, and the SS showed more frustration about being short-circuited in their murderous intent by allied victories than by any weariness in the task of killing. And this raises the question, though, of how Gandhi should be interpreted. Should he always be interpreted literally? It's a dangerous question to arise, uh, uh, or it's a, a dangerous question to answer, so I'm only raising it. Uh, and I'm going to look at the possible attitudes that we should sensibly carry in our mind when we read Gandhi a little later in this session. Um, I ha my interest in Gandhi hasn't gone totally unresearched, but uh, there are vast areas of uh, ignorance, and I mentioned three aspects of Gandhi's life earlier. Let me put the most difficult issue first. Why are there numerous critics of Gandhi in India? And why isn't there universal respect for him? Uh, I've been to literary festivals in India, and in these places like Kolkata, Jaipur, Delhi, uh, the visiting writer encounters young Indian vol volunteers, amiable and uh, um, uh, almost obscenely well-educated compared to many, uh, many of us uh, Aussie yobos. Uh, and they're there, they're willing to mediate between us blundering writers from around the world and the real India. And I have always asked them about Gandhi. These are the future leaders of India. You know, you say to them, what are you doing? And, at the moment, and they say, I'm finishing up a um, uh, master's in um, uh, international um, relations, but next semester I'm going to Georgetown to start my doctorate. Ah, and, um, or, or the London School of Economics. Discussing Gandhi with them, um, I find that many of them possess a degree of reverence for the Mahatma. But most of these young seem to consider him ambiguous. Uh, and at least one of them, uh, which shocked me as much as, and I apologize if it offends an, anyone in the crowd, one of them called him a silly man. And I think that statement came from somewhere in this area, what I'm going to say now. Gandhi's spinning wheel, uh, which was a protest against importation of British cloth 
but was also a parable, a device for Gandhi's method of meditation, and an apparatus that conjured up a tranquil, rustic India with land justice thrown in. That symbol does not impress them so much. The spinning wheel was, through Gandhi's influence, an item on the uh, Indian National Congress flag in 1931, but few think it's necessarily a fit symbol for an urbanizing, and let us not forget, nuclear India. They do not see that spinning wheel, symbolic of Gandhi, Gandhi as the defining icon for an ambitious Indian economy they hope to be part of. Interestingly, Marxists in India and the world have attacked Gandhi for a similar reason, accusing him of being sentimental about the rustic poor and indifferent to the growing numbers of urban poor. These young Indians are not ignorant at all of or indifferent to social urgent issues of social justice in their country. Uh, but in dealing with them, they are often influenced by other Indian and international voices that derive in part from Gandhi, Gandhi, but may not be directly Gandhi's. And they do not seem to look at Gandhi for political guidance, even though he remains a potent moral force in all their lives as in all ours. Gandhi was also criticized in his day by Hindus for not being Hindu enough, by Muslims after courting them with the caliphate, which uh, a promise that fell through, uh, by Muslims for being Hindu-centric. Um, in 1934, after an earthquake, he uh, blamed it on the Hindu um, uh, attitude uh, to the untouchables, the Dalats, and uh, therefore, um, uh, therefore a, a divine punishment. Later, he did declare that they're natural phenomena have physical origins. That didn't mean they didn't carry a moral meaning as well. In modern times, of course, and feminists have um, uh, attacked him, uh, both for his uh, so, so supposed psychological dominance of Kasturba um, the way he treated the inmates of the Sabamati ashram and the use of women to test his virtue. Um, and uh, he was a, a dualist. He did see, uh, which is something that occurs in all religions, he did see uh, the um, body uh, and soul as very different, and dignity residing in the soul and the body capable, therefore, of being sacrificed for the sake of the soul as those marches sacrificed theirs at Darasana. And one of his followers, Sarojini Naidu, um, came up with an aphorism which was not intended to for use by Gandhi's enemies, but was gratefully picked up by them. It costs a lot of money to keep Gandhiji in poverty. And there were complaints that his alliance with powerful patrons led to his using moral authority to put an end to industrial problems. Um, none of this generally appears in Western commentary on him. It's only occasionally that uh, one hears um, very strong uh, uh, criticism outside the academies. Uh, and um, in India, of course, Gandhi's image gives a moral patina to India's banknotes. But even there, there are interesting omissions, if I dare say so, in the way he's treated in his homeland. I was recently um, reading a biography of uh, Napoleon, Stephen Eglin's Napoleon, A Political Life. And Stephen Eglin uh, remarks on how there's hardly anything named after Napoleon in France. And there are no airports. Uh, now, Gandhi is an entirely different way uh, sort of man from Napoleon, but he is, like Napoleon, a sign of contradiction. 
No major French airport bears uh, Napoleon's name, and the, na the Indian airports that are named after Gandhi are after Indira and, uh, Indira and, um, and Rajiv. Uh, and indeed, in his own home state, um, um, in Ahmedabad, in the home state of Gujarat, uh, it's named um, the airport for a famous but less internationally stellar INC figure, Vallabhai Patel. When Joseph Lelyfeld published uh, this very interesting recent book, Great Soul, Mahatma Gandhi, and he struggled with India in 2011. He fairly gently raised the possible homosexual relationship during Gandhi's South African days between the young man Gandhi and an architect and bodybuilder named Herman Kallenbach. Now, I would have thought, given my reverence for Gandhi, that in India, that book would be banned. Uh, because, not because I feel any abhorrence for homosexuality, but I'm aware that homosexuality is still against the criminal code in, in India. The state of uh, Gujarat banned the book, but the public outcry in the rest of India was not universal. And the Indian Minister for Law, very wisely, in my opinion, said that he would not ban the book because the author himself and various Indian journalists had pointed out the value of Lely Feld's general observations and the gentle way it was raised in the book. And um, it was chiefly the Hindu right who were offended to the point of outrage. And um, uh, I found that very significant very significant uh, that there was not, uh, given the strong feelings that exist in that country, uh, which are, happen to be very different from the feelings that exist in this country. In the West, despite a general uh, reverence, um, as I said, uh, you do get um, people uh, criticizing, and they generally do it uh, without taking into account two factors. One is the, that have an impact on Gandhi's oratory. First, the cultural and religious influences deriving from the profoundest core of Hinduism and the way it enunciates itself to the world. And secondly, the hyperbole and gift for parables, which seem to be amongst the chief tools of prophets, including Christ. Um, I know that in advancing this argument about hyperbole, I'm contradicting what uh, the Darasana marches did on the basis of uh, taking Gandhi literally, but I still believe that we can't understand him unless we understand the culture from within, it, with, within which he's speaking. Uh, the, th there are plenty of examples in our culture, like Matthew 18:19. Uh, if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. Well, I think moderate Christians are right in saying uh, that um, uh, this is um, hyperbole, that it counsels by exaggeration and does not really counsel what it seems to. But even fundamentalist Christians who assert that each word of the Bible is literal truth, are not getting up to much eye plucking or ocular self-harm. And it seems that even in that case, Matthew 18, 19 yields to common sense. Therefore, it's surprising how many queue up to condemn Gandhi on absolutely literal Western terms. And I was reading in the Atlantic Monthly uh, a commentary on Lelyfeld's book by Christopher Hitchens, The Real Mahatma Gandhi, which attacks uh, Gandhi's 1909 statement that after independence, India would need to unlearn the colonial past. The railways, telegraphs, hospitals, lawyers, doctors, and such like have all to go. 
Is this the case of an utterance to be attacked in exact terms? Or is it a cross between a parable and a figure of speech, a transposition of the railways, telegraphs, doctors, etc., for the British who ran them with the idea that those things will later, after independence, be run by Indians? Or is it an, an, an instance of the silliness that the young man in Kolkata complained? Or is it both? Because prophets risk silliness at every turn and with nearly everything they say. Gandhi's appeals to Hitler in the 1930s are mocked. But I fear from the point of view of what we know about Hitler now, was it a bad thing to, um, uh, for a prophet to appeal to the good nature of a man who sadly, as we found out, had good nature. This statement of Gandhi's is harder for us in, to interpret. Uh, he told the British, not with any uh, sense of collaboration with Germany, not with any rancor, he told them that if the Nazis take possession of your beautiful island and your many beautiful buildings, you will give all these, but neither your soul nor your minds. If these gentlemen choose to occupy your, whole, so, your souls, you will vacate them. If they do not give you free passage out, you will allow yourself, man, woman, and child, to be slaughtered. Well, of course, Hitchens, uh, the late Hitchens, with his normal gusto, uh, attacked Gandhi for such uh, simple-mindedness and duality. Um, and, uh, uh, but what are we hearing? We're certainly hearing a counsel to composure of soul and resignation an acceptance of destiny, and of accepting destiny with dignity. Did he mean it all literally? I, I don't know, but I would only know after I'd spoken to someone who has a doctorate in, uh, in prophetic um, uh, utterance, someone who has a doctorate uh, in uh, Hindu oratory uh, and uh, someone who knew Gandhi uh, well, like um, Rabindranath Tagore. Uh, and is it naivety in any case to appeal to the resignation of people and to tyrants, to their supposed better n natures. Isn't it the sort of naivety many prophets have been, in quotes, guilty of? And the news that a venerated member of the species Homo sapiens is flawed shouldn't in any case amaze anyone or make headlines, because even um, uh, recently in the New York Times, a journalist uh, wrote of the international icon uh, Mandela, none of us who covered Mandela doubted his courage, his vision, or his character, yet some of the eulogizing felt sanitized. And the correspondent went on to recount some of uh, Mandela's vengeful glee at the fall of the previously mighty Afrikaans. Before you have an iconoclast, you have to have an icon. And Mandela was an icon of moral force, and Gandhi perhaps an even greater one. And now another aspect of Gandhi's life that I always found fascinating, and that is the, uh, which I'll talk about um, uh, uh, more um, uh, briefly than I have about the first one, and that is uh, Churchill's absolute abhorrence to Gandhi. Uh, famously, uh, when Gandhi managed to bring about talks between himself and the Viceroy, Churchill declared 
It's alarming and also nauseating to see Mr Gandhi, a seditious Middle Temple lawyer, now posing as a fakir of a type well known in the East, striding half naked up the steps of the Vice Regal Palace while he's still organizing and conducting a defiant campaign of civil disobedience, striding up to Pali on equal terms with the representative of the king uh, emperor. And of course, uh, Churchill's misunderstandings of India are well documented. And I don't want to run the guy down, but it did seem he won the war in Europe, but it did seem that his perceptions and his cleverness ran out round about at the Aegean uh, <laughs> before Greece and Crete, certainly before Gallipoli and certainly before Singapore, and had really run out by the time they reached India, which was a place he never physically visited. Um, it's for interesting psychological and geopolitical reasons that India, above all, shone as the touchstone of British prestige. And it looks stranger in 19, for 2014 than it did in 1934, um, because you had a representative democracy taking its chief glory from a country where most people were voteless. Uh, the, only the most privileged and the most propertied, five million, were permitted to vote for regional le uh, legislative uh, councils. Uh, and um, the Churchill was uh, constantly annoyed at the ongoing indestructibility of Gandhi and the impact he had, the visibility he created in world opinion and, and above all on the opinions of F.D. Roosevelt and his cabinet, who could see the irony in that contrast between representative democracy and unrepresentative colonialism that I mentioned early. Gandhi was the most visible and egregious flaw in the jewel to um, Churchill. Um, and India was so precious geopolitically that it could not be given legislative independence as the white dominions were in the 1931 Statute of Westminster. It couldn't be given power over its own foreign relations. Um, there was, as well as the limited franchise, uh, there was a separate Muslim franchise, uh, but all these uh, concessions seem niggardly to Gandhi the National Indian National Congress, and the millions who weren't included in the voting system. Sharing Churchill's disapproval was just one intersection between Australia and India, and Australia and Gandhi, and Gandhi. Another intersection was non-Gandhi and our uh, relationship in World War II. I think of many battles in which uh, Indians and Australians fought near each other and beside each other. The Indians who had no political rights and the Australians who had an array of them, e even though um, in battle that's not such an obvious um, uh, matter because in battle everyone shares equally the democratic right to be damaged or killed. But I think of the 45th Indian Brigade that fought between, beside Bennett's 8th um, uh, Division at a disastrous battle called the Battle of Mua River in Malaya in uh, 1941. And they were blamed, thank you, miss, that's a, a long, long distance service. And, <laughs> <laughs> and um, of course, when we land, uh, when the Japanese landed in Singapore, we were blamed for giving way on the west coast of, um, uh, of the island of Singapore. Not the fairly useless General Percival, but the Australians. So between them, the Australians and the Indians shared the blame for losing Malaya. The famous Quit India Resolution of 1942 
uh, really finally outraged uh, Churchill to a dangerous degree was taken on the Maidan at Gwalior Tank in Bombay, and it urged Britain, who'd already lost Burma to the Japanese, to begin an orderly process of withdrawal. And immediately that resolution was passed, um, the administration began locking up Congress party members, including Gandhi. Um, Gandhi was detained uh, in the Aga Khan Palace for the administration feared his death in captivity would provoke unrest. Uh, her, his wife, Kasturba, and uh, his secretary, Desai, died in that golden cage. And he was released in June 1944 because of fasts he had undertaken. Uh, these fasts now ran third to the, parallel to the third and last thing I want to talk about, and that is the Bengali famine. With that release from prison, um, the leaders of India became aware that a tragedy had occurred in Bengal. They had already heard rumors of it. And I've tried to write reliably about that in a book, Three Famines, a narrative essay on the nature of famines and how they often share the same DNA. It was a lethal but well-hidden famine that occurred while Gandhi was in prison with horrifying moral and physical results. The battening down of so many leaders stood in the way of their finding out. Gandhi's being criticized yet again for believing that the victims too were by their very decease, resistors and demonstrators of truth, that by their deaths they'd win the moral argument. It didn't quite happen that way, for the famine lacked what was needed for that result, visibility. The ban on news of the famine emerging from Bengal was very successfully enforced. A brave British editor of the uh, Calcutta statesman, Ian Stevens, defied the prohibition and published pictures of Bengalis dying of starvation on city streets and I've been unable to verify whether Gandhi saw them while still in prison. Um, many accounts of Gandhi's life and of the famine, uh, sorry, and of the Raj, such as Dennis Judd's history of the Raj, the lion and the tiger, uh, omit the fact that between three and five million Bengalis starved largely in 1943 into 1945. Starved or died, uh, the more common death, is by opportunistic fevers that strike the starving when their immune system has disappeared. I subscribed to a number of search uh, engines and had I typed in Irish famine or Ethiopian famine, uh, a plethora of books and articles would have come up Type in Bengal famine and you'll get nothing until just recently. Uh, there's a new book by a woman named Mukherjee. Even to mention the Bengal catastrophe is to draw hostility from conservative uh, British commentators who think you're accusing um, Churchill of the degree of malice shown uh, by Stalin in the willfully induced Soviet famine of the 1930s. But Churchill neither deserves that level of blame, but nor does he deserve exoneration. The trigger for the Bengal famine uh, was the impact of cyclones in uh, 1942, a tidal wave that flooded uh, the Ganges Delta, killed 15,000 people and spread salt and a deadly fungus across the paddy fields. And yet there was only a 5% fall in the crop and people shouldn't have died uh, of that um, in 1943 while 
all the leaders were still in prison. Human agency is what always seems to do the conclusive work in famines, and the British introduced a rice denial uh, scheme, uh, which was aimed at depriving the invading Japanese of rice, but of course ended up depriving, dr drove up the price and ended up depriving um, small farmers, weavers, peasants, umbrella makers, barbers and others uh, of, their, um, in, uh, of their food, uh, whose price had risen intolerably. The panic buying up and hoarding of rice was a result. Uh, and the government of India in 1942 uh, and the British Army also ordered the confiscation of thousands of Bengal country boats, the boats that do the commerce up and down the waters, waterways of uh, uh, Bengal. And that had a disastrous impact upon trade communication, the movement of people and foodstuff. As the famine developed, the Viceroy, was, whose name was Lynn Lithgow, with whom Gandhi often crossed swords, was not open to the proposition that things were as bad as people on the ground in Bengal said. And so he didn't invoke the famine codes, the provisions already humanely in place to deal with uh, famines in India. Um, the Bengal famine, in some cases, validated Gandhi's attack on the caste system because there were Brahmin women who starved because they could not bring themselves to eat gruel from the kitchens of the, the Bengali government set up for fear that it was food prepared by either lower caste or by Muslim hands. Some women, uh, now I should stop here and get an indication of time from my stage manager. A, a fi a five, we'll just about make it. Um, and uh, some women, widowed and abandoned, grouped together and immured themselves in houses so they could die with dignity, but most tried to survive uh, by any means possible. And the sleek brothel owners of Calcutta moved amongst an unsophisticated peasantry and offered them a pittance in return for letting them rescue their children from impending death. Uh, this issue is dealt with in Babani Bhattacharya's wonderful famine novel, He Who Ride, uh, Rides a Tiger, uh, in which a blacksmith who can find work only as a brothel agent discovers his own bartered daughter in one of the Calcutta premises he visits. And in Bhattacharya's So Many Hungers, a woman who is chastised by another woman for having traded, traded her daughter answers, you too will eat one day for you have a daughter. So there was a contrast between the morally elevated fasting of Gandhi in the Aga Khan palace and the unchosen and amoralizing effect of starving. It has to be said that within a week of taking office, a new viceroy, Wavell, of whom it was said once that after Rommel's attack in 1941, he was commanding in the Middle East, his fortunes fell so low that he was very nearly appointed Governor General of Australia. <laughs> um, Archibald uh, Wavell rushed from New Delhi to Calcutta. He saw the streets, he saw, uh, the starving at the gates of houses and by the glass fronts of restaurants and bakeries, waiting for the servants to bring out the water in which rice had been boiled, waiting for spoiled or surplus food. And then he moved into the countryside, which is called the M-O-F-U-S-S-I-L. -S I could make a goose of myself trying to pronounce that. What he saw there, was corpses scythed down at the height of their hunger by opportunistic fevers such as cholera and smallpox. And so he got to work and involved the army, not a subtle tool, but he involved them in the transportation of food and in inoculation. And that would continue over uh, 
nearly two years. He um, would be interrupted by a Japanese invasion, uh, which the British and Indian Army fought off, uh, and immediately resources were put back into dealing uh, with um, the famine. Um, interestingly, not enough wheat or other grains were sent to India to save people because the war cabinet didn't really believe that the thing was as bad as it was. And so uh, Wavell ended up with one twentieth of what he needed to save um, Bengal. And he declares that in, um, I shall not let Her Majesty, His Majesty's government think that they have solved India's problems for 1944 by a quarter of a million tons, when I've told them all along 10 million is the minimum. We don't know what Gandhi would have done had he been free at the time that happened, but we know he would not have been supine, and we know it would have been uh, uh, the um, occasion, uh, the provocation for a great uh, demonstration in his tradition and according to his principles. But he did remain in prison because of Churchill's animus against him. On the 5th of July, 1944, Wavell wrote in his journey, ju sorry, in his journal, Winston sent me a peevish telegram to ask why Gandhi hadn't died yet, but he has never yet answered my telegram about food. And here Australia intersects with India again, uh, if you try to type Bengal famine into the uh, National Australian Archives, uh, you will get nothing. It didn't appear on the radar of our government. Mackenzie King of Canada offered grain, uh, but our grain waited in great piles in the Australian countryside for shipping, uh, which had been reduced in the Indian Ocean, to take it to Europe uh, and the Middle East and anywhere uh, but India. In modern times, um, Amartya Sen has echoed Nehru and Gandhi's statement that the Bengal famine was the final judgment on British rule. Amartya Sen writes, famines are easy to prevent. If there's a serious effort to do so and a democratic government facing elections and criticisms from opposition parties and independent newspapers, um, such a government cannot help but to make some effort. Not surprisingly, while India continued to have famines under British rule right up to independence, they disappeared suddenly with the establishment of a multi-party democracy and a free press. And although not all food problems have disappeared, the famine stopped. How well Gandhi would have demonstrated that reality had he been free at the time, we don't know, but we know that despite old age, he would have. He would not have been um, supine. He would not have laid down his tools of authentic and peaceful protest. The Mahatma Gandhi convinced citizens across the world that they could win by civil disobedience of a peaceful resistance of a letting the truth free kind. He convinces us to this day that peaceful remonstrance can wring the hearts of the powerful and that truth can alter policy. Here in Australia, when we protest as a means of peaceful discourse with government, Gandhi's name is never far from our councils. And we look to the past when uh, the Charles Perkins-led Freedom Riders, uh, Aboriginal 
and white, uh, like their earlier American counterparts, traveled around coastal and inland New South Wales in 1964-65, demonstrating for Aboriginal integration and peaceably dealing with hostility and imprisonment, even though their bus driver became so scared he went bush. Uh, and, and they, again, much influenced by Gandhian um, method. And the, peace, the broker of peace in Northern Ireland, the remarkable US Senator George Mitchell, as senior fellow of the International Conflict Resolution Center at Columbia University, was also a student of Gandhi's doctrine and methods, and no doubt took Gandhi on his shoulder into the, his successful work as special on envoy. Look at his calm through all this. He could only have got that calm through considerable spirituality, a sane mother, and a study of Gandhi. And so here we are commemorating Gandhi on the day young men killed him for not being militantly Hindu enough. And reverting a moment in no spirit of flippancy at all, to the far from significant matter of the airport in Kolkata. It may appropriately have been named for Gandhi, who was in Calcutta on Independence Day and remained there negotiating peace between Hindu and Muslim during that entire season of blood and murder and rapine. It is therefore very interesting that Calcutta Airport is named for Chandra Bose, an Indian nationalist figure who believed in physical force and about whom there seems to be less ambiguity in India than there is about Gandhi. In the eyes of the rest of the Commonwealth, of course, and in the eyes of the Allies, Bose through the founding of the Indian National Army to fight against the British and with the Japanese in their intended breakout from Burma into Bengal was considered a traitor, and, uh, but he was a traitor to whom? To, to Britain or to an India that Churchill had a, declared not to be a country, but to have no more reality than the equator. What is certain is that Bose was an enemy of the Allies, and given my father was in the Middle East for three years. There's a certain ambiguity there um, uh, in me, but the story of Bose and of his men is one of the most fascinating tales of pre-independence India. But the great moral tale is Gandhi's. So to make up for Bose's being preferred to Gandhi at the airport, and with appropriate respect to that extraordinary Australian, the obsessive and overachieving Kingsford Smith, may I, for the next microseconds, retitle Sydney Airport the Mahatma Mohandas Gandhi Airport, <laughs> even though he would rather we called it Satyagraha Airport. This is a mere imaginative fancy a whimsy with which to end the lecture, but it is a serious whimsy, or to use a better word, a parable. And with apologies to the floor manager, that is it. Thank you. <laughs>